Eric Saul, Rachel Hayes, and they live in Tulsa. This is the second time they've been to Duluth. The first time was in 2016 when we had the 100 mile an hour winds and the power outage, so they got to experience a little different weather pattern the last time. But uh, it's a little more comfortable this time, right? Yeah. So, um, some of you may know, I'm, a, I'm originally from Kansas City. I've lived here about six years, and we had a gallery there from 1998 to 2003, and uh, both Eric and Rachel graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute in 1999, and so in that gallery we had their first solo shows and had more than one show for each of them. Yeah. And uh, so it's been almost 20, almost years, 20 years that we've known each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, I think the show's called Affinities, and you can see a lot of relationships, both color-wise, pattern, uh, between their works. That's why they've been uh, kind of displayed, intermixed this way. So I'll, I'll let you hear from them, <laughs> and um, you, you guys might just give a little background on yourselves. Yeah. Um, well, what you're thinking about art-wise, maybe what's coming up, what's in the future. Yeah, so I'm Eric. I'm uh, originally from South Dakota. I ended up in Kansas City to go to the Art Institute. I met Rachel there, she's from Kansas City. And it's interesting to think about 20 years ago because Rachel and I, we had been dating, you know, for a number of years, but we moved into a loft together in 1999, so it was 20 years ago, and it was a huge space, you know, as big as this entire uh, floor that we shared and worked in together, and that was really the beginning of what became kind of, even though we'd kind of worked as students yeah, we in met proximity, on the first day of school. and we met in, oh. we met at college, oh. but, <laughs> yeah. but um. When we moved into this loft, I think it was really the first time our work had a relationship where we would see it together every day. You know, I'm painting, she was uh, sewing and working on these large fabric pieces already back then. And yeah. a dialogue had started to happen, even almost accidentally without really talking. It was kind of an unspoken language that we were developing together at the same time with similar interests in abstraction, color pattern, uh, certain kind of mark making that were unique to our own mediums, painting, and, and fiber, textiles, so. Yeah, I'm very much a builder and not a painter, but I love color. And working with Eric has been always, you know, going to his studio and, and talking about how do you pick out that color? Why do you put that color next to that color? And having those kinds of conversations. And then just hearing you talk about the loft and seeing these, I mean, I started making these huge pieces because we had to divide the space somehow, or <laughs> into rooms, and we would, you couldn't, they were so big, and we, and you can't heat 5,000 square feet with a, you just, with no money. Yeah. And so you, I started really like building with plastic and fabric and like what kind of walls would I want to live with and surround myself with? Because we have a lot of friends that would just buy giant sheets of plastic and use that. And yeah, Rachel would make kind of a room like, for us. I'm not we into could that. Mm -hmm. And so that actually led to the first show that first two shows, just thinking about those things that I had with Joe, was, you know, these floor to ceiling walls. One was, the first time was really colorful and had a few layers of, of materials that I'd found at thrift stores, and um, the second show was much more minimal and muted with, uh, with lots of sheer plastic. So Joe's always been really supportive of, of, of this way of working, and, which is very different than, you know, it's not uh, necessarily something that someone can take home and, and put on their wall and live with like a painting. So in that way, Eric and I have been a nice like yin-yang as an artist couple and being able to support ourselves through different opportunities. 
in the art world and navigating things that way. Yeah, but there was always a, throughout the years, kind of an interest in a similar language influenced by similar interests um, with yeah. things that we surround ourselves with in our home and collect. We collect a lot of textiles and, and we've always both been attracted to the kind of uh, language of shape and mark and, and pattern. Um, and also experimenting a lot. Like Eric is always like, it, it, you know, there's a lot of different ways that he puts a painting together. Yeah. And it has changed over the years. And same with the way that I use like different textile processes. I love to sew and, and after a huge sewing project, that's the last thing I want to do, and then I start crocheting or <laughs> messing around with my photographs or and give my body a break in a different way, use a different part of my brain. Same, similar. Yeah, and I think for me, like I had just finished um, recently a bunch of large paintings. I had done 20 of these paintings that are about the size of the, the blue painting out front. And right after that, I just had gotten a ton of these tiny canvases because I just wanted to see things in a different way and, and similarly kind of use my body in a different way instead of like gesture and this kind of relationship to the canvas and body movement was more about kind of seeing almost pictorially like a different kind of space and like the quicker nonchalant movement or something. So I think we both are open to kind of an improvisation in response to the work. Even though our process is quite different. I think neither one of us <clears throat> often will say we know what anything's going to look like before we start. Yeah, it's um, both really intuitive. Yeah. There's a, a, maybe a, a, you know, a general idea. You might map out a little bit more because you, especially with... I have to prepare you, my you, materials you, in a different way. Yeah, and more and more as you have commission projects, there's kind of, you know, something that has to be proposed and a result that happens. But even with that said, you know, there's still like very much an organic process to get to the end. And I think we both have always embraced that type of working where you just kind of respond to the material and you have like a relationship to how you put it down or Yeah, and I love when, it. And when he, he lets the paint drip, he lets paint be paint and do what it's going to do. And, and I like to do that with my materials too and not try to like stretch them make them not want to do something. You might that have they threads kind of hanging, which is almost like dripping paint or something. Yeah. It's so it's it's side uh, it's inspiring and allows <clears throat> me to think about my materials and my way of working, which sometimes can be a little bit more like um, oh refined or tight or you know very process based. I love working that way and but I also like to shake things up. I think that's when things can get interesting and have a, a different sincerity to them. Rachel, you might talk about what a typical project of yours is. <clears throat> Not that they're each the same, but this would be on the order of small compared <laughs> to a lot of the things you've done. Yeah, and even compared to like the show that I had 20 years ago with, with you. And um, it really just depends on the space and the opportunity. This, this piece, this large piece, is one of five that was this size that I made for a, a space in Tulsa. And the size of that piece was kind of based on the windows that were in the space. And I lifted the shape of the window off, off the wall and repeated it. And, um, you know, it's very much like a, 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 a counter to Richardson of like, how does it feel when you move right next to something that's much larger than your body? Like to me, it feels really good. And, and, and uh, I really like working that way. Um, it feels really freeing and um, like a new way of thinking about these materials and 
in case you don't know who Richard, Richard Serra is, oh. he makes very large steel structures that have weird curves and torques. They almost look like they fall over. He uses shit builders to help him build these. And so they're, you know, if you were gonna define like a masculine work, those are pretty masculine type works. And I love them. I love that they made me feel something. And I also love, you know, that you can also get up next to something like that and notice, uh, you know, the, the details of the steel. Similarly to like, you can, you can have a large impact with the scale of a piece but then hopefully you, you are drawn to you know, how the hand stitched, hand stitches or like the different sheens or, you know, there's two experiences, at least it's my hope. So um, I really like, you know, just standing here and seeing like, you know, there's I can see through the piece, so I can see like four things going on, and there's a lot of interesting things happening right there. That's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm working with a space. And I like it to, for it to look good in lots of diff different directions, not just like rarely is there like one way to look at something. Like I like to think of it in the round. Yeah, there's often an interesting thing that happens with that work too, where it's like, it, like you're saying, you can see through it. Mm -hmm. And it makes you aware of the space you're in or around, but you're also never not aware of the thing itself. So it's kind of draws attention to itself and the space. And the color itself. is like a power move, totally. Because color is, is something that can bring like a, um, you know, a guttural response to with in a scale. I mean, it's a way of like bringing people in, and then. But I like to, you know, this this piece in particular has a lot of like blues and oranges and and reds and and you know, there's a lot of like um, complementary color play in this piece, and also with the trying to find a balance of light and dark and opaque and translucence and it's like a very intuitive game when I'm building, making it. Eric talked about going from making big work to small work and you have smaller work here. Is that a different endeavor? I mean, yeah. How does I mean, that... a lot of these smaller pieces, I feel like they're from like my think tank, like my, my studio of like ideas that could be, you know, they like, can hopefully stand alone, but also can be built upon in some way in the future, maybe. I love literal move, movement. Right. There's a, a, some videos back there, and this piece is in there blowing in the wind at Eric's dad's farm in one of the videos. So there, I love to see the pieces, uh, the work actually activated. Because it has that capability, so why not let it do that? So yeah. There are a lot of improvised interactions with her work that happen, you know, in places. You know, we'll travel with pieces because you can pack them down pretty small, and she'll take them out, and, and she has a whole series of really photo-based work where she'll kind of direct the photo. And I'll either be her photographer or the person kind of manipulating the material for her as she photographs because it's, it's a different, they're ephemeral moments with the pieces out in the landscape, mm -hmm. and often movement, weather, or things that influence those interactions. Yeah, and I'm lucky to have a partner like Eric to help me do those things because we have two small kids and there was definitely a time where I didn't have, uh, I mean, that was my only way to like, to make work, like let's just take it outside and take, just play with something. The kids can be there, we're not like having to keep anyone quiet and we can just like be ourselves and make some work happen. So. And sometimes they help too. They yeah. Them all too. <laughs> if you watch the video, sometimes you can see them pop up. 
I think some of that movement in my work comes from embracing the process of making, you know, and being very spontaneous and trying to figure out how to embrace the right moments and walk away, and not overwork things. And I think some, you know, it's, it kind of harkens back to a type of painting that is maybe resonates with like ab expressionist painting, you know, like kind of capturing a moment. But I'm also interested in how that movement just translates to uh, mood or relationships to other ways that I interact um, in space. I was a skateboarder for a long time, and I think there's like a certain kind of playing around with moves and tricks and things that happen. It's, it's like a parallel language in a way for me that took over when skateboarding kind of went to the side a little bit. It was like a different way to kind of be playful in movement and have like a, um, a way to navigate space, with, whether it's like a pictorial space or like a you know, surface space versus going through space. You know, because I've always just been intrigued with the gamesmanship of making a painting, what it makes, what it means to do that. How do you improvise your way through a canvas, the way you kind of improvise through the sidewalks, you know, or anything. You know, so there's, there's an interesting it's play. Gestural as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gestural and, and playful. Rachel, when you were in school, like, so how did you, how did you find fabric? What did you? I found, I found fabric, I loved to dye fabric when I was in, I was in through the fiber department and that I loved playing with, I was dyeing cheesecloth and like sheer silks and velvets and like removing the pile off the velvet so that there is this opaque and translucent play. And, um, and then it just became, I think I got a little frustrated with the nitpickiness of some of craftsmanship and I just was like, if it's bigger, or you know, like there's a lot of things, but in hindsight, I, I think like maybe that was my way of like pushing up against something and I could build it, I could build that way. It just, I, I think of sewing as like, you know, it's like welding or, um, and it was, it made, you know, it was like a, I guess it was, it felt confident building with, with those materials enough to try it bigger. Yeah. And, um, and then after school, I didn't have access to all the dye pots and, and safety facilities, so then I started buying more fabrics. And, um, experimenting with the acetate to get like in layer on color and vinyl to create new colors since I wasn't really dying anymore and um, and then when it came to to go to grad school I was encouraged to apply to the painting department because of the color that I was using and so I just kept doing my thing but in the painting department and being surrounded by that language. I was, I was wondering how um, like place informs your work because you've traveled to a lot of places and lived a lot of places together. And I know that, you know, I, I think Eric has mentioned um, how these networks informed by both urban and rural environments. And then with your work, um, Rachel, I feel like, you know, some of those installations are so like, kind of like morphing into the landscape, mm -hmm. but in their own beautiful way. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, about how that works what you Well, it was like, it seemed like a lot of things happened, you know, it, or a, a lot of things crashed together at the right time. And one was having small children, moving out of New York City and um, moving to New Mexico and having my studio right there by connected to the house and kind of out in the landscape. And then also have, at the same time, 
receiving like three huge pieces back from that had been in traveling shows. And, and just being at the right time, right place, and um, being familiar with that landscape out there and knowing like a few different spots and having these huge swaths of material to play with. And, you know, for example, the series from White Sands is like a, a white, you know, a white cube for Eric. It was like a white space for me to like see, see my pieces that are so huge and to go out there like I was saying, and, and um, experiment and play and not be like bothering anyone. And having like total freedom after feeling like you have none. It's just like something cracked open and <laughs> I keep trying to get back to it. But <laughs> no, I, I mean, I feel like I made a lifetime's work in one year. Like I can, I can pull from that what I did in one year for for the rest of my life. I feel like, and just from having that that generous space and time. So to answer that question again <laughs> is, it's just like I love. I like to figure out what works with space. Whether it's like we're making a canopy in between these two buildings, like we're gonna take advantage of how high it's gonna be, and like what what we've got to work with instead of like forcing something upon it. I'm gonna work with what's there, what parameters are there. Same with lands, the landscape. And I love all the different references that happen. That just like from familiar like seeing laundry outside or seeing textiles out to dry in, in India. You know, like there's so many things that, that can, you can conjure up. There's, and then just like abstraction, land art, yeah. it's ephemeral. It kind of, I'm thinking, like just thinking about how the different places kind of influence, you know, hearing you talk about what you're describing as, you know, the time when we ended up in New Mexico after a few other places, Iowa and New York City. But um, I know for Rachel, like we had shared the studio in New York for a while, and it was in an industrial building that had a lot of freight activity still, and it was it was a real job just to get to the studio because it literally was kind of like fighting traffic, and then you could never park at the building. You were always like going around a lot of workers just to get to the front door and it was like an obstacle just to get to work sometimes mm -hmm. and i think that you know everyone kind of responds to that stimulus in a different way but um, i think of the different studios having a, an effect kind of like if i think about it in terms of music mm -hmm. like how musicians record in different studios or like in the middle of a song might like go to a different studio that's known for having like a certain resonance or something like my studios always have that effect on me wherever I go it's like it takes time to move in and unpack and like kind of feel the mood and the vibe of the space and then like what what does what kind of work does it permit or evoke you know just from the energy in it and it's, there's been so many different places you know we've we've had 10 plus studios in 10 years or something so it's always like you're kind of readjusting and then in some ways that is invigorating because there's always a new kind of feeling because of the studio itself and the place that it exists in and the neighborhood or city you navigate to deal with that and so all those conditions like my work doesn't specifically speak to or address like directly those interactions you know it's not like this is a new york city painting you know that you could point out but i i can sense it in there like where I made those paintings, what kind of mood I was in. So they, they have a, an effect for sure, I think. Um, yeah, it's interesting how that happens. And we're now, we're gonna be in a transition again soon. We'll kind of move to a new studio and see like how that affects what it becomes. We don't know what it is yet. Yeah, it's kind of stressful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
thank you guys all for coming. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer more questions or whatever. Yeah. Is he, uh, <laughs> I just wrapped it up, I guess. <laughs>